it, the final frontier of meningiomas is not going to be surgery. It's not going to be radiation. It's going to be molecular genetics. This is the future. This is where you all are on the cusp of knowing the future. Because if this is a, a chromosome 22 abnormality, and that's an NF2, and that you see that there's this difference in genetic abnormalities, you young people who are, will be neurosurgeons in the future, you'll have a better way to treat it. You will look at the way I treated it, and you will laugh. And I will be long and gone, and I will accept your laughter, right? Because we look at people who used to use Thomas guides and go, well, what was that? Pay phones, right? Just a generation ago, it was pay phones. You're going to look at, well, people rode horses to work? No. And you're going to look at me and go, oh, Dr. Yang drove a car and drove it himself. That's archaic. The future of tumor treatments and meningioma treatments is going to be genetics. It's going to be how you look at all these chromosomal alterations. That for atypical meningiomas, who grade two, there's a lot of chromosome one deletions. For who grade three, they're, they're much, much higher. And that these 1P14 cutilation, I know it sounds like alphabet soup, but these different kinds of deletions and chromosomal abnormalities are going to help you define which tumors, how they behave, what their growth rate is, and what their prognosis is. And this is a, a paper by Dr. Yu, who's actually now currently a, a spine surgeon at the Leahy Clinic in, in Boston, and, and he helped put this together. But I do think this is the future, that we're going to find the molecular and genetic fingerprint of gliomas, meningiomas, brain tumors, and instead of treating everyone the same, like McDonald's, in and out, in and out, same Happy Meal, everyone, we're going to get a different profile based on all these patients. And I'm going to end with serendipity and luck. Um, you know, Michael introduced and said that I was a NIH-funded lab and stuff like that. And I just want to pause because for full disclosure, uh, I'm not an NIH-funded scientist. I have zero NIH funding and I'm just not a real scientist, and that's okay. I'm just going to keep working and doing my best, and I probably will never have NIH funding, and that's okay too. I'm just telling you the truth. It, it, it's okay, but what we do have is a real energetic, passionate cohort of scientists and researchers working together to study brain tumors, even without NIH funding, just institutional grants, and we have a North American Skull-Based Society grant, so thank you. I have to plug them, um, and so we have a grant from the North American Skull Base Society. Oh, their meeting is in a few weeks. So I have to plug that too. I hope to see you there. So there's a structure called EMP2. And I know it's more alphabet soup, but it's a marker on the surface of cells. And we were studying this in glioblastoma because that's another brain tumor. We talked about the most brain, common brain tumors. And in brain cancer, we were looking at it. And we found that EMP2 is more correlated to the cancers, glioblastoma, and less correlated with the low-grade tumors. I know, you thought I was talking about meningiomas. Trust me, I'm getting there. And you can see these circles. This is called tissue microarray, where you take circles of all these different kinds of tumors, you put it in a giant, giant array, like a, a huge row of these tiny circles, and then you can stain, mass stain all of them for different things. And this is that paper. We were looking at tissue microarray, and there was a whole bunch of slots like, like a hundred slots, hundreds and hundreds of slots. And we had a few slots that were open. And my fellow at the time, Dr. Chung, who's now a neurosurgery resident at USC, and Dr. Prolargos, who was a neurosurgery resident currently at Oklahoma, they were like, Isaac, there's these three slots. What do we do? Should we just run it? And I was like, no, I don't care if you spit in those three slots, you know, anything. Just don't waste those three slots. Well, what we did was we put meningiomas into the slot and we found that meningioma stain for EMP2. I thought this was contamination. When they brought it back to me, I said, this is wrong. This can't be right. Ha ha, funny joke. Ha ha, go back, do it again. Well, they did it on a few samples. Here you can see they did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven samples and they all stained for EMP2. I said, well, that's a little funny. It's, it's possible to get one contamination. It's hard to get seven. And this started becoming a, a topic of study in our laboratory, because here you can see a meningioma. This is uh, in the planum. This is in the pituitary uh, region. This is in the cella. It's completely encapsulating the carotid artery. That's what the arrows point to. 
you will never, ever be able to resect this tumor. I do not care if you are God, the surgeon himself. This tumor cannot be resected in its entirety. So if it's not, what are, what are other ways we can target this meningioma? And I think EMP2 is going to be really a cool way to target it because we found that's increased in meningiomas. We found that's increased in meningiomas. And we also found that it's not in non-pathologic dura or brain. So you don't see it in normal brain. You don't see it in normal dura, but you only see it in meningiomas. And so this is a target that we can attack. And so we ultimately did 16 patients and we found that it's expressed in all 16 patients. I still hate the 100% rate, but that's what it is. That's what the science shows. We use this to get the North American skull base uh, study data. And I can currently tell you the most up-to-date data is that we have now done over almost 40 of these tumors and we're still finding the same EMP2 expression. You're the first people to know this. Uh, we haven't published this. We are you know, going to write this up. We're going to present it at North American Skull Base Society 2023. But we are in the middle of this study. And just to give you the preliminary heads up, and if it sounds like I'm excited, you betcha I'm excited. I love it. I've been studying this tumor my entire adult life. And to find something that's in all these tumors, that gives us hope that if we can target them with a chemotherapy or a radioactive material, or even make them glow, like my friend, Dr. John Lee at UPenn is making these tumors grow, that we will have a more targeted way to identify and treat these tumors. And if you want the specifics of this, this is uh, written up by my chief resident, Dr. Kunal Patel, uh, who's currently the chief resident here at UCLA, and this is in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Uh, those are the details there for uh, this paper. But yeah, I do think the future is molecular therapy. Uh, this one was uh, published by Dr. Choi, who's a neurosurgery resident at UCSF, uh, more than a decade ago, thinking that the future of treatments are not going to be surgery and radiation, but it's going to be molecular therapy. Uh, I don't do this work by myself. I, I hope there's no misconception. Remember, I told you I'm not NIH funded. I'm not a real scientist, but I am surrounded by real scientists. I am surrounded by really smart people. Uh, and these are some of the smart people here, uh, including the medical students, the fellows, and the undergrads uh, that are in our lab. Uh, they're really the scientists, the smart people, the researcher um, that I'm just honored to present uh, our work together. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.